Welcome. This is Ann Windsor here at New Life International Apostolic Ministry, and I want to share with you today a historic message on divine healing. This is a message by John Alexander Dowie called The Five Porches of Bethesda. He was the mentor of John G. Lake. He was the agency that God used to bring healing to the Lake family. When, as Dr. Lake said, it seemed that we had a train from hell going through our family and nothing could stop it until a man came into our lives who was brave enough and true enough to preach to us Christ as a healer. And he was referring to Dr. Dowie. I can't go on to that whole story right now, but I just wanted to share this message with you to encourage you if you need healing. This account is given us in John chapter 5 about the paralytic that was taken every day and laid by the pool of Bethesda waiting for the troubling of the waters. At that time, in Jesus' day, when the waters were troubled, the first person that got into the waters received healing. How all that happened and how all that got set up, I have no idea and I have never heard anybody talk about the particulars of the troubling of the waters and how all that came about. But apparently the waters were troubled periodically by what they believed was an angel and when a person stepped, the first person that stepped into the waters received healing. The problem that this man had, however, was that he was bedfast and had been for 38 years. And he told Jesus, he said, when I am coming, when the waters are troubled and I am coming, someone else steps down ahead of me. So it's a very pitiful story, really. The man's story is a very pitiful story. For 38 years, he's been trying to come to the waters and someone always steps in before him. But praise God, the waters came to him, the healing waters came to him. And so this story has a has a happy ending. One of those live happily forever after endings. So I'll read you the verses here. Dr. Dowie doesn't particularly go over the verses. So I want to read them, open by reading them to you from the scriptures. This is John chapter 5, verses 1 to 9. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. And whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. And Father, though these words that I'm going to share from this sermon was given over a hundred years ago now, Father, I thank you that they're living words 
that the Holy Spirit breathes life into them. Because the principles that are shared in them, Father, have no time limit on them. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will just breathe through these airwaves, through this audio recording, Father, and go out and enter into the hearts, into the ears and the hearts of the hearers. And Father, just as Dr. Dowie says, and described so marvelously when that man heard the words of Jesus it was like someone playing on the strings of his heart and his whole body vibrated with the sound of Jesus words and so father I thank you that as these words go out they'll live again and play on the heart strings of those that hear them in Jesus name I thank you amen The Five Porches of Bethesda I shall speak this afternoon concerning five beautiful lessons of Bethesda. The Apostle John is singular in that none of the miracles mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are mentioned in his gospel, except the feeding of the 5,000 and the incarnation and resurrection of Christ. John casts around his incidents certain very far-reaching and spiritual thoughts and puts them in beautifully single sentences. Jesus has come up to Jerusalem to attend the feast. As he reaches the city, he comes on the pool of Bethesda and looks into the pool. There are five porches around the pool. He passes through the porches and at last comes to a poor man, sick for 38 years, who has been pushed away from the sacred spring. The man is lying there miserable and weary, and we can imagine his cry. Oh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah my healer, hast thou come to earth? Is it true that thou hast come to save us? O oh, Jehovah Rapha, hast thou come to open the eyes of the blind, to give hearing to the deaf, and to make the lame man walk? O oh, Christ of God, hast thou no hope for me? He pauses as he hears the voice. Wilt thou be made whole? And he looks up into the face of a man who is looking down at him, asking that strange question, Wilt thou be made whole? Now, you can imagine a man in this condition, who had been carried there for over 30 years, turning around and saying, What is the use of asking me such a question? My mother carried me here to this pool when I was a baby. My father brought me here when he could. The hands of those who loved me best are moldering in the grave. And I have only a few friends to carry me here now. But others push me back and when the water is moved I cannot always get down to the pool. But I still hope. I have been 30 eight years sick. The man that is speaking to him has said, Wilt thou be made whole? And there goes right down into his heart a strange sensation. His whole being vibrates like a harp when every string is touched by a master hand. That is a voice unlike anything he has ever heard. Wilt thou be made whole? Gently he explains that he has no man to help put him into the pool, but that others, when he is coming, step down before him. Then he waits with his eyes fixed on the man who has so strangely 
appealed to his will. He gets ready for the very next moment. He hears the voice of him who is the resurrection and the life of him who is the Lord of lords and King of kings say, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And in a moment, there comes into his body with that word, power. And he rises, takes up that bed, rolls it up and walks home. Set free from the bonds of Satan who has bound him for 38 years. You know, I just want to interject here. If you're needing healing in your body, you must let the healing scriptures affect you like the words Dowie describes the words of Jesus affected the heart, the inner man of this man who had been afflicted for 38 years. Let me read it again. You know, we cannot read the healing scriptures just flippantly. They have to resonate on the inside of you. They have to play on your heart strings. They have to make the inside of you vibrate, for they are Jesus standing there speaking to you just as much as he was here in the flesh speaking to this man. Let me read it again. The man that is speaking to him has said, Wilt thou be made whole? Imagine Jesus looking at you and saying that. Put yourself in the place of this lame man, sick for 38 years. And a man walks up and looks you in the eye and says, Will you be made whole? And there's something about him and those words that he says that makes your whole insides vibrate. Dowie goes on and he says, and there goes right down into his heart a strange sensation. You know, that's what happened to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They walked along and they didn't yet know it was Jesus till later. But they rethought back and they said, oh, how our hearts were stirred, burned within us as we talked with him, by the way. The word of God should make your heart burn. It should be it should burn with hope. It should burn with faith. It should burn with the greatness of him who is the resurrection and the life. There goes right down into his heart a strange sensation. His whole being vibrates like a harp when every string is touched by a master's hand. That voice is unlike anything he has ever heard, and that is the way the healing scriptures must be to you. There must be a voice in them that is unlike any voice that you've heard, any doctor's diagnosis. The voice of your body with its pains or whatever infirmities, whatever it might be, the voice of Satan, the voice of people, the word of God must be a voice to you unlike any other voice that you've ever heard. Going on. As the fountain of Bethesda had five porches, so there are five aspects to faith that I shall now present to you. This is very interesting. Five aspects to faith. The first is perceptive faith or seeing Jesus. The first thing in connection with faith is to see. When you see Christ, you will perceive that he has power and is willing to heal the sick. When you really see him with the eyes of your heart, you will perceive. When you really see, then you perceive. And you perceive what? That he has the power and to heal the sick and that he is willing to heal the sick. 
that he is the perfect Savior and there is none beside him, that he is the healer and there is none beside him, that he is the cleanser and there is none beside him. We walk by faith and not by sight, but it is faith that leads to sight and to feeling and to conscious realization of his presence and power. Next, receptive faith, receiving Jesus. The first one was perceptive faith or seeing Jesus. The next one is receptive faith, receiving Jesus. While there are many who see him, they see what he's capable of. Because when Christ comes into a house, the devil has to get out. And when Christ comes into your spirit, the devil has to get out of your spirit. If you are going to receive Jesus Christ by faith, you must understand the terms on which he will come. He will come on conditions that you will do what he tells you, even in your eating and drinking. So if we see Jesus, we see him. Dr. Dowie goes on then how important he's dealing in his day with people, alcohol, tobacco, different things like that. He's preaching a sermon here to people, not only for healing, but for salvation. People that are Christians, but yet carnal, and they indulge in these worldly habits. He says, if you want Christ as the healer of your body, then we need to lay aside these worldly habits that destroy the body. He goes all into that. I'm not going to cover that right now. I'll be posting this document, however, and it'll be available for you to read the whole thing. But I want to point out the receptive faith receiving Jesus as your healer. You can see that he heals. You can see that he's healed other people. You can see that he has the power to heal. But then you have to receive him as your healer. Just like you had to receive him as your Savior. You saw that he was the Savior. You heard the word preached. You saw that he died on the cross for the sins of the world. And then you saw that he died on the cross for your sins. But even after you saw it, it would have not have benefited you if you had not received him as your Savior. So you perceived him as your Savior. Then you received him as your Savior. It's the same thing with healing. The five porches of Bethesda where people were lying in order to be healed because they knew that God was the healer and he healed periodically at that place. Well, he who was the healer took on flesh and walked among those five porches. And he had to walk up to that man. He did. He walked up to the man. He offered him what he was looking for. And the man perceived that Jesus could do it, and then he received Jesus as the resurrection and the life, Jesus as his healer. So perceiving Jesus as your healer, that he's got the power to heal you, then receiving him and letting be your healer. You'll see that more as we go on down here, especially on the last point I really want to get to. Next is, Retentive faith or holding fast to Jesus. Retentive faith. Remember now going back first was perceptive faith or seeing Jesus. Second was receptive faith, receiving Jesus. And the third is retentive faith or holding fast to Jesus. Now. We must take another step. It is the hold fast faith that professing Christians so manifestly lack for the most part. Then he tells about a young man that was laughed out of his faith in God, young convert. And because his friends laughed at him, he went back to the bars 
and his life was ruined. So he's stressing here the importance of having a whole fast faith. You may have served the Lord for many years as a Christian, and you have a good whole fast faith where your salvation is concerned. But whole fast faith in the area of healing must be developed. Hold fast faith in the area of peace of mind, casting your cares upon him, finances, all the different things that living the Christian life entail. You must have a hold fast faith in those different areas. It is steadfast faith that men want. It is the holding fast to the truth and purity, and righteousness. The holding fast to the word of God, the holding fast to Jesus. Take heed. Be not leaky vessels. Sometimes much is lost because there are little holes in the vessel and the water runs out of the little holes. I have seen people take a bucket to the well and fill it with water and come back and put it on the shelf to stay there overnight. And then they go to it when the night has gone on a piece, and they find no water there. Why? There was a little hole or two in the bottom, and it all went out. And there are a great many holes in the faith of some of you Christians. And all the blessing you get on Sunday trickles out through those little holes. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and when the next Sunday comes, you haven't a drop of blessing left in you. Instead of finding joy in the service of Jesus and in communion with God and in reading his word and in leading a clean and holy life, you have forgotten your vows. Your blessing has leaked out because you did not hold fast to it. So when a time of great trial comes, your faith is gone. Let's talk about that a little bit. Steadfast faith, that holding fast faith, that retentive faith for healing. Once you determine that you're going to believe God for healing in your body, you're going to be tested as to whether you've got any holes in your bucket, your container. The devil's going to poke you to see if he can get your faith to leak out. You know, in a way here, Dr. Dowie was talking again a lot about people with their salvation. They get a blessing when they come to church on Sunday, but then they don't go home and live it. They live like the world. He says, this is what he says. You have let it run out by foolish jesting, by playing cards, by going to theaters, by going to balls, by reading novels, by doing underhanded things. Instead of finding joy in the service of Jesus and in communion with God and in reading his word and in leading a clean and holy life, you have forgotten your vows and your blessing has leaked out because you did not hold fast to it. When you get, you hear a sermon on healing, when someone prays for you, you have to hold fast to that and not let it leak out by focusing your attention back on the world because it just will not work. This is something you have to give your full attention to if you're not only going to have healing, but you're going to have divine health. And that's one of the things that I want to see people come into, not only getting healed, having instances of healing, experiences of healing, but actually coming in to living in divine health. Hallelujah. So be careful. When you get prayed for, make sure you have retentive faith. Not just faith for the moment to perceive, not just faith to receive, but faith then that retains. Faith that retains. By giving your attention, as he said here, here, Serving Jesus, communing with God, reading the word, and leading a clean and holy life. Next, this was an interesting one. Action faith, working for Jesus. 
Now I ask you to take the next step, which I call active faith, working for Jesus. You say that you are an average Christian. Well, what is that? Well, I get shaved every Sunday morning, put on my best clothes, and go to church. Well, what more? Oh, I join in a little in the singing. I like music very much, and I sit back and listen to the choir. Well, what else? I pay for the singers and the preacher, of course. We have a smart, up-to-date parson. Oh, he does preach wonderfully. He never hurts anybody. He never calls anybody names, as you do. He says we are mighty good people and pats us on the back, and he is a smart fellow. Yes, sir, Ree, I am no saint. I am an average Christian. Well, my friend, you are very candid, and I will be the same. I will tell you what you are. You are a sham and a fraud. If all your Christianity lies in helping to pay a quartet and a minister to read and say nice things for you and then go back to the stock exchange and your various other pursuits to act in the same ungodly way as before, you are a sham and a liar. And it is my duty as God's minister to tell you so. Another says, I am a Christian. Well, what kind of Christian are you? Oh, whenever there is a revival, I take my Bible and hymn book and I go and join in. And I enjoy it very much. A nice sort of Christian you are. What are you doing for God in your daily life? In your workshop, in your city? What are you doing for the sick, the suffering, the poor? What are you doing for the heathen in Chicago as well as in Africa? What are you doing in Christ's name for humanity? Get up and get to work. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. There are many Christians who are Christians in theory only, and there are worldlings in practice. Mm. I thought about this step, action faith, how it plays into our subject of receiving healing. What a proud a person that's sick. You know, when you're sick, a lot of it's a it's a it's a natural reaction to have all of our focus on ourselves. But you know, this step that he's talking about here, action faith, working for Jesus. Think what it would do for you. Even if you're not well, if you if you were in your bed in pain. What, what if you lay there and prayed for somebody else? What if you're in the hospital and you spoke a word to someone that came into your room about their soul? You know, normally, unless we're unconscious or we're in so much pain that you can't, you have no self-control, the pain is totally controlling you. There are ways that we can work for Jesus, even if we have symptoms in our body. And you know that really helps because you're getting your eyes off yourself and your sickness. And the sickness and its loud voice in your life will begin to dwindle away because you're getting your focus on helping someone else. So I believe this is a very vital point here that can be practiced many times even when we are sick. Having an active faith working for Jesus. Get active faith and go out and work for Jesus. Next, and the last, the fifth porch, Bethesda, if you want to put it that way. Let's review it again. The first was perceptive faith or seeing Jesus. Next, receptive faith, receiving Jesus. Next, retentive faith or holding fast to Jesus. Then, action faith, working for Jesus. And finally, we come down to the sweetest part of all, that I really have read this whole thing just to get to. How precious, how precious this last part is. Resting faith. And you know, if you have symptoms in your body and you're in a state where you're in so much pain, you can't hardly think, of course, we should do this anyway as you you uh, hear this, you will see 
what I'm talking about. Resting faith. Hebrews 4 says, We who have believed do enter into rest. So there is a rest for the people of God, even in receiving healing. There is a resting faith. When, when we're in pain and we want healing in our bodies, so many times we have anxious, we're anxious, we're struggling. So that's why this last point here is so very, very, very important. Resting faith. Now comes the last step. Passive faith. Resting in Jesus. When you get so you can rest in Jesus, you can step into the fountain. Capital F, fountain. There is no faith so mighty as passive faith. For strength comes to him that rests in God alone. Next comes the last step, passive faith, which is resting in Jesus. You know, it says in Hebrews 4, let us therefore labor to enter into the rest. So passive faith is not as easy as, as two word sounds. Because it takes a labor to enter into this kind of resting faith that rests in God alone to do the work. Not begging him for it, not pleading, not crying, resting that he's doing it. He's watching over his word. He's performing it in your life. When you get so you can rest in Jesus, you can step into the fountain. There is no faith so mighty as passive faith. For strength comes to him that rests in God alone. When I pray, I never excite myself for a moment. I get excited about sin and disease and death and hell and the devil's own work, and I strike for God with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But of all the lessons that God has taught me, I think none is as sweet as this. That when I pray and step down into that fountain with the sick and the suffering, then I rest. I rest in God. You with whom I prayed for healing know how brief my prayer is. You know how still we are. The teaching is over. The pleading is over. And he's not talking about pleading from God. He's talking about pleading with the people to believe God. The decision is over. They've decided they're going to trust God for their healing. The teaching is over. The pleading is over. The decision is over. And the fountain is open. Hallelujah. The pool is open. In quiet faith we step down. And into the fountain, in the name of the Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and in accordance with the will of God, our Heavenly Father. And we go beneath that cleansing stream, and we are well again. Oh, that is so wonderful. That is resting faith. We just step down into the pool. We don't have to ask God, beg God for the pool. It's there. We just have to step into it. That, that's the same as the principle of the vine and the branch. Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branch. And if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. The same life that flows in the vine flows in the branch. That's what causes the fruit to come on. And that's that fountain of life. In quiet faith, we step down and into the fountain in the name of the Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and in accordance with the will of God, our Heavenly Father. 
and we go beneath that cleansing stream and we are well again. I liked it, what he said here. This is so important. We go beneath the cleansing stream. A little dab won't do you if you want to walk in divine health. A little dab. You have to get down beneath the cleansing stream. Hallelujah. Just like in water baptism by immersion, when people are totally immersed and the waters completely flow over your body. That's how it needs to be for healing. But it is a supernatural operation of the Spirit of God that you receive, that you believe. Oh, hallelujah. That fountain is open wherever you are. Because God is omnipresent. Healing is wherever God is. And God is everywhere. He is the fountain. What does it say? We step into the fountain in the name of the Lord. In the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is everywhere. And we go beneath that cleansing stream. And we are well again. When I finished my address on this subject one day, seven years ago, in San Jose, California, a little lady in the back of the room, with infinite pain upon her face, and supported partly by a friendly, <clears throat> by a friend, and partly by her crutches, came forward to the platform. She looked up into my face and said, I have come. Oh, I have suffered so long and so much. I want to step into that fountain. I want to be healed. I belong to Christ and I will rest in him now. I said, very well, very well, very well, very well. And I prayed just a few words. <clears throat> the crutches that had been her support for years, were laid down. And the lady straightened herself up and walked right away without pain, saying, I have been in the fountain. She walked a number of blocks to the house from which she had been carried that day. Oh, what multitudes I have seen enter Bethesda, God's house of mercy. Not merely for salvation, but for healing. And is not that fountain open to you? Can you hear him talking to you now? Can you hear the voice of Jesus in these words? Is not that fountain open to you? Oh, I am glad it is flowing freely. It is more than a fountain. It is a river. The river of life. And in the midst of it, and on either side of it, is the tree of life. Bearing twelve manner of fruits. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The river is the Holy Spirit. Christ is the tree of life. And the leaves of the tree are his words. The river is the Holy Spirit. Christ is the tree of life. And the leaves of the tree are his words. For it is written, He sendeth his word and healeth them. It is for you. Come now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It is for you right now. And I'm just going to reach out my hand, my faith hand, to you. And if you're ready to step down into the fountain, let's do it. 
because I know that I know that I know. I know by the word and I know by experience that he who believes on him will not be put to shame. I have experienced Jesus as my healer for years now. From minor things, from major things. So I am sharing with you from what I have seen and heard and experienced. And I invite you to come and step down into this fountain of life with me. Father, I just pray right now for those that have listened that need healing in their bodies. You see what each person is afflicted with. You see their faith touching the hem of your garment, Lord Jesus. And I thank you, Father, that your life, your fountain of life, we step down into it, Father, as Dawi said, beneath that cleansing stream. Cleanse your people, Father, of their sicknesses, their diseases, their infirmities. Father, their oppressions and anxieties. Oh, Father, that cleansing stream, that living fountain of life. Let it flow over them right now. Just, just rest right now and receive. Just receive in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I worship you. Just worship him with me. Just say, Lord, I worship you. I receive from you. Thank you, Jesus. You're healing me now. Thank you. You're touching my body. Thank you for that cleansing fountain flowing over me. Just take a deep breath right now. Relax. Letting the fear of that disease go. The anxiety over it. Hallelujah. Be like the man at the pool. When the words of Jesus resonated in his heart. And captured his attention like no other words of any other person. Let Jesus your healer capture you. Father, I thank you. Thank you for this message of encouragement, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.